Good afternoon. Let's get started. Let's have some fun here. Uh, my name is Kevin Jones, I'm owner, chief strategist of Ectobox, uh, here with Lou at ACD, uh, president, chief bottle washer, he tells me, maybe also CEO, and also Frank Galuska of uh, Ectobox, uh, an IoT engineer. What we'd like to do today is to talk with you about some really interesting technical topics. Uh, typically, when Lou and I get on calls like this, uh, when Ectobox and ACD partners up on webinars like this, we are very often talking about high-minded ideas, theories, strategies, very high-level stuff about Industry 4.0 and how the devices out there can really help companies become data-driven and help drive uh, production throughput, better quality, and you know, in the end, uh, drive uh, revenue or profit, company valuations, et cetera. Today uh, is one of our Tech Box series uh, events, and we're going to get into some really interesting technical stuff. And we're going to try to keep this pretty short, to shorter than most webinars. We're going to keep it to 30 minutes. And at the end of that 30 minutes, after we're done going through some content, uh, we are going to then uh, uh, open it up for questions if anybody has any. Uh, the idea with today's call is to uh, understand how to get visibility into your plant with Siemens PLCs. Uh, what we'll do is to start off with, again, kind of that high-minded theory uh, kind of stuff about Industry 4.0 and what the purpose is, but I'm going to keep it pretty short. But essentially what I want to do is to lay the ground rules for why we should care about doing this kind of work. Uh, with that said, uh, we'll talk about uh, why and how we choose technology that's really going to help us work with companies and develop manufacturers as data-driven organizations. And then again, of course, we're going to get into the how-to. Uh, with that said, let's get started. Manufacturing, as you all know, you live it day in and day out, no matter what your role is. Manufacturing is very challenging these days. I had a conversation a few months ago with one of our customers that's east of Somerset, Pennsylvania, and uh, he had said, uh, today compared to two years ago, Kevin, it's really tough. Uh, cost, uh, labor, uh, to getting work done, supplies, delivery, everything is so much more difficult to get products manufactured. Uh, and uh, I completely agreed with them. I see it everywhere. We all see it everywhere. Uh, and a lot of those uh, issues come from, you know, more com uh, a more competitive environment, more expensive, limited workforce, et cetera. And there are even within the plants themselves, uh, lots of challenges around machine downtime, production throughput, et cetera. And with this increased competitive nature, but companies still want to, at least some companies want to still thrive and survive, uh, they really need to become uh, more data-driven. I mean, what they need be before even thinking about becoming data-driven is to get that direct visibility into the plant floor, get that real-time visibility into what's going on in the plant floor. Then once they're able to connect to the devices, connect to the people, connect to the other systems, pull that data out, convert it to valuable information, and start showing it on uh, panels or tablets uh, for the operators to understand the value of their input and the value of their work. Put it on the big screen TVs to uh, start to set up some accountability. Put it on the laptops and desktop computers of the people working in the offices to really understand what's going on. Only then can companies really start to uh, drive a lot of improvements and production throughput, et cetera. But this is what a lot of companies look like today. Uh, you might have an ERP system here, which has maybe 15% of the data that really exists in your plant. You might have a few Excel files or a whole bunch of Excel files throughout the plant. You might have a couple access databases. You might have a CMMS system that's completely disconnected from everything else, maybe a LIN system, uh, et cetera. And it becomes a real mess. Uh, and once you start to try to connect some of your devices, your PLCs and everything else into the system, a lot of companies have been creating discrete connections between one system and another. And when they're doing that, it becomes really difficult to improve that whole environment because you're just kind of continuing this spaghetti mess of, of information and connections. What we ought to be doing is striving for what we think of as a holy grail, to become a data-driven company. And that means to connect everything and everyone uh, into a network and then at that point, all layers of the business are integrated and everybody's going to be operating uh, on the business that's available from all of the other layers of the business. And the stakeholders are going to know the state of the business in real time uh, for what's happening right now and what's going to happen in the future. The way I like to think of it is, and I, I usually pull up my hands and point to my palm and say it's the single version of the truth. 
What we need is that single version of the truth where you have the data and the tools uh, available to you, uh, broad access to the data so people are allowed to see the data across the organization. Uh, people uh, are able to, they know how to use that data, know how to make decisions. They are enabled to make decisions, but most importantly, they can take action and innovate on the plant floor. Uh, the core of that idea of becoming data-driven is the single version of the truth. Uh, and once you can establish that, uh, then you can share the data across the organization. Getting to that point can be pretty difficult and daunting. The way you do that uh, is by setting up a basic framework for getting to that point, setting up a digital strategy to define the value that uh, you as a company, a full company that comes from leadership, define the value that you subscribe to that data or uh, uh, assigned to that data, uh, and then uh, recognize how you're going to use that data to advance the purposes of the company and the goals of the company. Define that strategy, and that strategy is then going to help you make a lot of decisions within and keep you focused on becoming a data-driven company. Uh, use some standards and some ideas from IC95. Uh, use some technology rules, like the four technology rules we like to subscribe to here, lightweight, report by exception, edge-driven, and open technology. Uh, and then as you're going through this process of becoming a more data-driven company, we think of it as a digital transformation, sometimes an overused marketing term, but I think still valid. Uh, uh, but really what it means is incrementally, project by project, building up that connectivity, but doing it with this architecture, this design, this strategy in mind ahead of time to then ultimately achieve that single version of the, tra um, single version, uh, of the truth. Uh, those technology rules, I'll just reference real quick because we're going to use those, reference those in our conversation here. Lightweight uh, refers to data protocols. Uh, it would be better to use data protocols that uh, are less verbose, that take less data to transmit information across the wire. Uh, example, OPC UA is very verbose, uh, takes a lot of bandwidth, especially if you're connecting to a lot of data uh, devices. MQTT, on the other hand, uh, is very uh, lightweight and less verbose. And so once you start to communicate data using the MQTT uh, data protocol, uh, you're leaving open a lot more bandwidth to communicate yet more data from yet more devices. Report by exception. Let's report the data only when it changes rather than the typical uh, uh, PLC poll response kind of process. Let's push or publish the data in one direction. That helps with less bandwidth. You're not doing the poll response kind of thing. Uh, and second, uh, data is going in the right direction. Uh, with poll response, if there's a firewall in between, you've got to open up holes in that firewall to allow the, the polling process to actually communicate through to the PLCs or other devices. Uh, and uh, if you're just going one direction, don't have to worry about poking holes in the, the firewall, uh, more secure. Uh, Edge-driven is driving the data from the, the edge process and some of the decisions from the edge process. And open technology is using solutions that are open to being connected with. You don't have to pay an arm and a leg to get connectivity to a data file, an access database, a SQL Server database, a historian of whatever type, uh, uh, REST APIs, uh, data brokers, uh, MQTT, OPC UA. Uh, it's all there. Uh, and uh, I think another way that I uh, would define open technology is not proprietary not the big company, big stack proprietary uh, solutions, which they try to imply that you really need, but you don't if you know what you're doing. Uh, if you have a few technology rules, if you have a strategy to choose uh, your technology. Some of the technologies, companies on the right are the types of products uh, uh, that we like to use because they subscribe to these kinds of rules. We're gonna be using Canary and Canary Labs Historian product and the Axiom tool uh, in one of our demonstrations here and a lot of the other technologies uh, really apply very well too. Actually, I should have uh, ignition from inductive automation here as well. Uh, one of the, the uh, items that I'll point out here is near the bottom of this list, which is the uh, unified namespace, an idea that comes from ISA 95, uh, enterprise site area line cell. It's a way of organizing your data into specific slots so that once you're collecting data into that single version of the truth, across the organization, not just the plant floor, but even the front office and the ERP and the CMMS and everything else, 
you then know where the data is at and it's well organized. Uh, and then you, from the, with the ideas of using MQTT with its data broker and that data broker becomes a single version of the truth and also the unified namespace within that data broker or other tools like Hybyte, then at that point, uh, you can have a really well organized single version of the truth and you can start to implement solutions like this. We go through some of this content and some of the other videos uh, in the meantime, I want to make sure my comments are brief. We can leave Frank for as much as much room as, as uh, possible. So what we'll do in this uh, conversation here on uh, this tech box uh, video is to talk about how to get data from a Siemens PLC. There are some traditional methods to do it, and there are some newer ways to do it, following some of the rules and the architectures that we've just talked about. So Frank, uh, can you start off by talking about some of those traditional ways to get data from a Siemens PLC? Of course, uh, the traditional ways, uh, you've mentioned a couple of them in your presentation so far, Kevin. Um, OPC UA, so some Siemens devices like the S7-1200 that i um, using for this demonstration, uh, has the ability to host a OPC UA server and uh, have its tags made available in that server to other platforms like Ignition and Kepler um, that can communicate using those protocols, as well as um, proprietary drivers. So Ignition has a Siemens driver that allows um, for direct communication between Ignition and device. So for uh, the kind of traditional solutions with Kepware, um, we love Kepware, we're a partner with Kepware and PTC, uh, but having said that, uh, it has some challenges as well. Every solution has some drawbacks. For Kepware, what are some of the challenges uh, of using uh, a product like that for uh, working with a Siemens PLC or, or other PLCs? Yeah, one of the, uh, the challenges is, as you mentioned, um, OPC UA is a pull response protocol so you're hitting that Siemens PLC asking for however many tags, 50, 100, 200, all at once um, at, at a set interval, um, one second, two seconds. Whereas, you know, maybe not all of that data is changing every second. So why, why ask for all of it? Totally fair. Absolutely. Good. So uh, before we get into some of the, the newer ideas here, I didn't think to... Uh, leave a little bit of room for, for Lou. Lou, did you want to say a few words, any thoughts on what we're talking about uh, so far? Yeah, just or in general, um, and, and excuse for the, the background noise, I'm having some work done in my home. Um, you know, I, I, I was listening to a, a, um, a futurist the other day, and just from a manufacturing standpoint, we have to get our, our, our manufacturing friends to get away from the philosophy the philosophy of break fix to analyze and anticipate solve um, and i thought that was very powerful and this is what we're talking about today but just as a general sense that's where we have to be we've always been brought up you know from our appliances at home and in our our cars to almost this break fix mentality and this you know this whole webinar and everything ectobox does is moving moving that that that's a paradigm shift if you will yeah, yeah, absolutely. And one of the things that we like about uh, uh, working with ACD uh, and having these kind of conversations is that we're all of the similar mindset uh, that we need to help manufacturers get better in the way they can get better because things are getting more competitive. Essentially, repeat of what I've already talked about is getting that visibility, direct visibility into to what's going on. Uh, and that then that direct visibility, that becoming a data-driven manufacturer, single version of the truth, you have all of the data there for uh, the current state and the future state of the business. At that point, you can start to be more proactive. It's not break fix. It's not reactive maintenance. It's proactive maintenance. It's condition based uh, maintenance and monitoring. It's predictive. Absolutely right. Correct. All, yep. all the rest of those kinds of ideas. And proactive we, versus inactive. Very good. Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah, exactly. So with that said, I'm going to turn back over to Frank. So Frank, what? how would you describe uh, this new process, this new method, using these four rules of uh, uh, technology for selecting the right technologies. Uh, how does this process work for how to pull data from a Siemens PLC and get it over to 
uh, a Canary Labs. And before you answer that, uh, I should uh, make sure that I step back and, and say, let's let's pretend uh, that we are in a plant a brewery. We've actually named the brewery. Uh, what was it called, Frank? I think Big Bottle Brewing in New Kensington. Uh, yeah, big name, I think. Just big uh, big name brewing. It. Yes. Yeah. Right. Big name brewing in New Kensington, Pennsylvania. We're uh, hoping and expecting they'll open up a brewery there sometime soon. Uh, and in fact, there is going to be a brewery opened up across the river. Uh, and that brewery uh, will have a bottling line. And that bottling line is called Mabel, M-A-B-L. I've kind of forgotten where that acronym came from, but the B-L stands for bottling line. And uh, what we're doing here is monitoring part of that bottling line with the PLC. Uh, Frank, remind me if you could, please, what data are we monitoring with that PLC? Yeah, we're, uh, we're monitoring. Monitoring things such as the the in feed and the out feed, um, so how many bottles are produced, as well as um, a, a heating coil, uh, monitoring the temperature of that and a fault that can occur due to that heating coil going over a certain um, set point. Okay, and what we've done in the demo unit we've used here, thanks to ACD uh, uh, and their team uh, uh, from this demo, uh, is that we're able to derive some OEE values from this as well, if I remember correctly. Is that right? Yeah, that's, that's correct. So um, with some of the uh, calculations available in Ignition, we're calculating OEE and generating um, that type of data. Good, good. So if you could, let's start to get into uh, how this solution comes together, You know, assuming or understanding that at the bullet points at the bottom of the slide here. We're getting real-time data. We're able to use less bandwidth because we're using MQTT Spark Plug B. Uh, the solution can work on-premise and in the cloud. And ultimately, what we're creating is a more scalable and flexible solution. Some of those data point or, uh, points, especially the more scalable and flexible, happy to get into, and we do get into that in other videos. But to save time for Frank here, how does this work? Yeah, so um, if you want, I can go ahead and Share my screen here. Yes, and yes please. I'll stop sharing my share. Walk through a, a little bit of what I put together. Okay. All okay. right. I can see your screen. Good. All right. So this is a um, Mary. Yep. A virtual machine that I have running on my on my laptop here, just to kind of keep things separate. Um, I have Ignition installed on and the Siemens PLC sitting next to me is connected via Ethernet to my laptop and going um, then through a shared NIC to this virtual machine. Um, so if I go ahead and open up Ignition Gateway here, I can browse to my um, login again. I can browse to my um, OPC connections, and for the the purposes of this, I, you know, even though Siemens and Ignition they have a, a driver for Siemens devices, I just you know many many places don't uh, offer that type of flexibility. So just if you have a generic device out there that can speak OPC UA, it's be the same process to get information into Ignition. Um, you can establish an OPC UA connection like I have here for the Siemens to bring that data from the PLC into Ignition and eventually out to Canary. Okay, so you're establishing a connection from Ignition to the PLC. So we're using Ignition uh, uh, from Inductive Automation, which is an industrial development platform for SCADA and MES systems. Correct. And, okay. Uh, and Ignition has other um, capabilities, you know, such as the ability to communicate MQTT and that protocol, which were big fans of, um, and some other drivers, such as Allen Bradley drivers and, and other PLC drivers. Mm -hmm. So now that um, my connection has been established here, if I open up my Ignition designer, you can see I have about uh, two dozen tags or so here coming from the PLC. I have the, the heating temp highlighted there. You can see it ramping over time. Um, just as the PLC's 
doing its thing, you know, executing its code, heating temperatures ramping, in feed and out feed are incrementing. Um, so we're we're in production, so to speak. Bottom of line. So question is now that uh, this data is in ignition and we're generating some OEE calculations here for availability, performance, and, and overall OEE number. Uh, how do we get that data then out of ignition and into a more permanent um, historian such as Canary Labs to kind of track over time, view how our plant's running over the course of a longer time span, a couple of years? So, so ignition has three uh, MQTT modules. And the one that I'm going to focus on right now is this transmission module which allows you to make a connection between the ignition uh, tag base and convert any tags it has into MQTT tags. So if I go into my transmitters here, see I have a new Kensington transmitter that's using the default tag provider and my tag path of big name brewing new Kensington. So what that is doing is grabbing all of these tags in this default tag provider. Anything under big name brewing New Kensington um, is going to be converted to MQTT and pushed to any uh, uh, any other platforms that are subscribed to this topic. Okay. So all of these tags are, are being sent in this case to Canary Labs um, it is, or rather Canary Labs is subscribing to all of these tags. Okay. So let me, uh, is the next step to go into Canary and talk about Canary? Cause I want to stop you there just to review uh, and use that diagram we have. Is it Canary the next step then? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Now that the information, uh, now that Canary is subscribing to it, um, you know, we can get into Canary and, Okay. It's data being historized and do some pretty neat visualizations in there. Okay. So then let me cut over to my screen uh, again just for a little bit to revisit that diagram that we have, uh, just mm -hmm. to review what we've talked about so far. Um, okay. So you should be able to see my screen at this point. Um, so what we've talked about so far is the uh, Siemens PLC is communicating with the transmitter. Uh, uh, via OPC UA, and then it is from there that the data is converted into MQTT, spark plug B, uh, goes into the engine and the distributor within uh, Ignition, which effectively is the data broker. Uh, so we're publishing data into the data broker, and then Canary is going to subscribe to that data. I'm going to throw out a, a quick thought. Some people might be on this call saying, well, the gee whiz, Siemens uh, has an MQTT uh, a client or module, and it can publish data via MQTT. Yes, completely true. However, that data is what we call flat MQTT. MQTT is really great because it's lightweight and very flexible. <clears throat> that's a good thing, and that's a bad thing. Uh, that flexibility can be a little bit too much, and so what we really like to do is to start to, to narrow the, the the scope or definition or the, how the data is organized. And so what we like to do, we're big uh, subscribers, so to speak, no pun intended, uh, to the Spark Plug B specification. Spark Plug B specification defines how the data is organized and adds a few other things to MQTT. Again, more information in other videos that we have. Uh, and it's the Spark Plug B specification that the MQTT module within the Siemens PLC doesn't cover. So that's why we are pushing the data into ignition as an OPC, uh, as the OPC UA data protocol. Once it gets in there, we're converting that data to MQTT Spark Plug B, and then moves on. And the screens you've seen already from Frank, you have all of the, the the tags available. You uh, set the connection to the to the PLC, boom, you've got all the tags. Once that data is converted to MQTT Spark Plug B, he showed you a screen uh, with the the tag browser. Uh, for the data broker, boom, you've got all the tags available. Uh, at that point, that data is ready uh, to be subscribed to by, or subscribed by uh, Canary. Okay, just wanted to throw that out there. Frank, uh, any comments or corrections? 
I uh, just want one comment is, you know, not only does Ignition do that conversion for us of OpenC UA to Sparkplug B, but it also allows us to do um, those OEE calculations that aren't yeah. PLC isn't doing natively. Right, um, right, so we're right. able to calculate our quality and performance and availability. And good, good. So we're actually getting a lot of the logic uh, of, uh, of calculations uh, developed a little bit closer to the edge here with this kind of solution. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> all right, I'm going to stop my share. If you could, Frank, reshare and continue with um, with Canary Labs. Yeah, so I will share my screen again and uh, go back to the CM for a second. Good. So, uh, yeah, as Kevin mentioned, we're, Canary Labs is subscribing to this data in Ignition. Um, so I have a, a local instance of Canary subscribing to this data, and then that local instance is then pushing data um, into the Canary cloud. Uh, so if I bring over a web browser here, I have on my other monitor, you can see uh, some data that I'm getting out of that PLC into Canary. So I have my OEE calculations there, as well as that heating temperature and heating oil fault, and some trends of my in-feed, out-feed, and, and, and as these update, uh, Canary is subscribing to that data and screen. And since it's Canary and it's a historian, all these, all this data is being logged, so I can scroll back in time and see uh, how things change over time trend. Good. So and, then, oh, go ahead, sorry. Go ahead, please. I was just going to summarize what we've talked about so far. So effectively now, uh, Canary, because it follows this, you know, idea of open technology and uh, can use the MQTT Spark Plug B protocol, that means it knows how to subscribe to a data broker. Uh, you set it to subscribe to a, a, the data broker that is on your virtual machine. Uh, and through a couple other details, which we're happy to describe at some point, if, if, if anybody cares to know, how that data is then getting to the cloud. Uh, this cloud is a cloud instance of Canary that Canary hosts themselves. And we get that, so Canary subscribes to the data, gets the data into their cloud environment, into the Axiom tool, uh, and then uh, you can see the data here. Uh, a couple of points. Uh, one is that Canary can work on-prem as well. We simply wanted to use the product in the cloud to show, hey, yeah, you can get the data in the cloud if you want to as well. But there is a version of this that works perfectly well, really, really well on-prem. We have multiple uh, clients that work with Canary uh, on-prem. Second is that one of the things that we really like, one of many that we like about the Canary Lab product uh, is, well, a few, couple things. One is that they have great historian uh, it's a great competitor to a lot of the other products out there, too. Uh, it has a really nice visualization tool called Axiom, uh, and that allows for really nice quick prototyping and piloting uh, of solutions. Uh, and usually what we'll do is to pilot projects using Canary Labs, and then once we get the data into Canary Labs, we start to prove the value of the connectivity, the real-time access to data, et cetera. Then we will uh, start to use other tools like uh, Ignition from Inductive Automation or Factory Studio and fact frameworks from PatSoft to develop more full solutions, MES uh, applications. Uh, and then at that point, Canary uh, and the Axiom tool are really, really great for storing the data uh, and modeling the data, doing a lot of other things, and also uh, useful for troubleshooting uh, at the real detailed level for process data. Okay, enough of that out of the way. Frank, what else? Yeah, so uh, one thing I, I want to go over is just how how easy it is to add new new, new tags into Canary. Great idea. So as since my tag path is this big name brewing New Kensington, uh, anything within that folder structure, so anything underneath this New Kensington folder, is what Canary is subscribing to and what is available in the Ignition data broker. So actually, at the, the start of this webinar, um, I added a, a new tag here at the bottom just called webinar. Uh, mm -hmm. And that, that's the only thing I did is I, I added a tag here in Ignition that was underneath that path. And if I go to Canary, hit the Add Trends button, 
you can see here, I have my big name brewing in Kensington packaging line one cap, uh, capper webinar. So that tag has already uh, gotten this way to Canary. It's, uh, that's part one of the benefits of the unified namespace that as more tags are available, um, there's very little, if any, configuration on, on this side of things to get them to appear in the history. So if we were not using MQTT, Sparkplug B, if we were not using unified namespace and data brokers and all that, we were doing this in a more traditional way, let's say with Kepware, you want to add another PLC, another line, uh, another machine, and you know several PLCs. What does that process look like? to add a new PLC with all of its tags, et cetera, and get them into some kind of tool for visualization, storage, et cetera. Right, so um, not only would I had to have, you know, configured the, the PLC and added that tag into something like Ignition to get the data in here, um, many visualization uh, platforms also have their own tag database. So I'd have to manually add that tag there as well and kind of make manually make that connection between the two. Um, but with a data broker and MQTT and the unified namespace, I'm just, I'm simply getting uh, everything associated with that all in one. So if I were to put it uh, another way or, or using my hands, that's very visual, uh, we have the data here in a PLC. Uh, for the first PLC, we've got to set up the, the tags here in the PLC and then set up the tags in the destination effectively. Uh, uh, and do that through a manual process. And then if you want to add another PLC, same process, manually setting up all the tags. And another PLC, manual process of setting up all the tags. Is that fair? Yes. Okay. And here, instead, with MQTT Spark Plug B, by the nature of the protocol uh, of the data brokers uh, and some of those rules that these, uh, these, these technologies follow, uh, the tag structure uh, is published from the PLC into the data broker, uh, uh, and then as soon as another PLC uh, is available, it, if that PLC has the same tag structure, it will publish right into uh, that same uh, data broker structure within the unified namespace. Did I get that right, Frank? Yeah, yeah, as long as um, the, the data um, you're adding to the data broker is part of the pathway that, uh, Canary or whatever other platform is subscribing to, then yeah, that, that data is automatically um, connected. Yeah, so then that's where, like you say, the, the unified namespace becomes really important. We agree ahead of time at the outset of defining your digital strategy, your architecture, the technology rules, and finding the technologies, you're gonna also define your unified namespace. And what's your naming conventions? What's your naming structure? Big name brewing? Uh, is the enterprise. The site is New Kensington. Uh, you've got that mapped out, uh, and then everything would publish uh, in under, yep, right there. Uh, and then from there, you go into uh, area site line, or uh, uh, area, area line, line, line. Thank you, yes, area line. So, uh, uh, and then one of the other really nice things, too, that I'll highlight, which we talk about in other videos as well, is that with this unified namespace, this is not only for getting data from PLCs and looking at just process data, but rather you can actually do publish back into that data broker from other products. So if you were to have an MES system that pulled the data from that uh, PLC, pulled the data from the mother PLC, pulled the data from an ERP and started to calculate OEE, because you, maybe you for that situation you needed additional data to calculate OEE, what's the availability, what are the specifications of the machines, or what they can produce, et cetera, the MES system then could publish that data about the calculated OEE back into the unified namespace, and then you'd have that data available here uh, as well. So again, that's where the data broker with the unified namespace starts to become that single version of the truth. Thank you, everybody. Really appreciate your time. Uh, we're looking forward to doing the next one. Next week, same bat time, same bat channel. Uh, it will be on November the 11th at 3 o'clock, and in that video or webinar, we're going to be talking about how to get the data from your Siemens PLC into an E1 Flexi product, and then from the Flexi out to the web. The idea being that companies that like to use E1 Flexi to monitor their systems, especially service departments, uh, 
Uh, very often we find those companies are reaching out into the manually reaching out into the the flexi devices to see what's going on see the settings make some setting changes pull data get status etc download data logs but it's 2021 it's nearly 2022 data should be coming to you if you wanted to and it can do that securely especially with the e1 flexi and its platform uh, and we're going to show you how that works so tune in next time. Kevin, and, uh, what, is this, yes, what is the new saying? Uh, uh, data, the next oil. Oh, oh yes, yes, right. Yeah, it, it's really the process of driving that data, becoming data-driven because that data is incredibly valuable and that data is the next oil.